This recording is for the mini lecture on perception with a few additional sensation concepts that will be covered on Friday, October 30th. We're going to start with the additional sensation concepts. Sensory interaction is the one concept that we really didn't cover yet, and it's the idea that sometimes senses can augment or enhance one another. Um, and what that means is that uh, one sense can be made better uh, due to the use of an additional sense, which will then um, improve it. Um, for example, vision and hearing are certainly enhanced. If you've ever watched anything with uh, subtitles on, uh, you end up hearing what they're saying, what the characters are saying better than if you don't have the subtitles on. If you've never done it, definitely give it a shot. Um, what's ended up happening is that by reading the text of the subtitles, you create an expectation of what you're going to hear in your brain, which then lowers your absolute thresholds, making your hearing more sensitive and allowing you to hear better. Uh, taste is a sense that certainly uses other senses to enhance it. While certainly we have different taste receptors within our tongue, much of what we taste is due to our sense of smell. Uh, smell contributes close to 75% of the sensations or the flavors of what we taste. Additionally, vision can influence how we taste something by creating a sense of expectation. If it looks really good, we're going to want to eat it more. Um, and additionally, touch also creates uh, um, a better taste. And that can certainly be discussed when people uh, don't like certain foods due to it having a certain texture. Uh, so it can affect a person's ability to taste. Along with sensory interaction, we also have two kind of sub-senses. These are both connected to touch. Uh, the kinesthetic sense is our sense that allows us to feel the movement of our muscles and bones. Uh, this is obviously very important um, because if we didn't feel our muscles and bones, we could uh, move our bones or muscles to the point where we could damage them and we wouldn't know we're damaging them because we wouldn't feel the pain. Uh, so the kinesthetic sense, uh, forces us to stop when it hurts too much, when we move our limbs in a way that it doesn't, that it shouldn't. Uh, additionally, uh, the kinesthetic sense also allows us uh, to support ourselves um, because we have to be able to feel the pressure against our feet when we stand or the pressure against our butt when we sit and so on. Connected to the, the kinesthetic sense is the vestibular sense, which is our sense of balance. Our sense of balance is controlled by uh, a structure uh, in the inner ears called the vestibular sac, which is attached to the cochlea. Um, and there are uh, tubes that connect it from the cochlea called the semicircular canals. Uh, and basically, uh, when we move our body, the fluid in the vestibular sac also moves. This sends a signal to our cerebellum, uh, the part of the brain connected to balance and coordinated movement. And this causes us to uh, adjust our weight so that we don't fall over. Uh, so it kind of tells us what our body position or our head position is uh, so that our body can adjust so that we won't fall over. A lot of perception is based on visual perception, which is the sense that uses more of the brain power than any others. Visual perception uh, is kind of how our brain interprets all the signals coming in uh, from our eyes. Depth perception, which is an aspect of visual perception, uh, is our ability to see the world in three dimensions, our ability to perceive the world in three dimensions. Now, this can be done in one of two ways, depending on how close an object is. If an object is close, we're going to use what's called binocular cues, meaning that we have to use both eyes together in order to perceive depth at close distance. One of these binocular cues is retinal disparity which is the idea that each eye sees independently from the other. And if you take a look at some object far away and kind of close one eye and then close the other eye, kind of like a camera one, camera two thing, uh, you'll see the object move. But what your brain is doing is making those images come together. And when they come together, uh, this allows us to perceive uh, this third dimension uh, in terms of which is depth, uh, especially at closer distances. Another binocular clue is, cue is binocular convergence. Um, and this is when our eyes have to turn inward to see something very close to, you, close to us. A good way of testing this is to hold your hand farther away and then bring it close to your face 
Uh, eventually, the image will become blurry and form into two images. But as your eyes look in at that image, uh, it will become one again. And the movement of the eyes, uh, specifically the movement of the eye muscles, uh, sends a signal to the brain uh, to tell our brain that that object is close due to how much we've moved our eye muscles. Uh, so binocular convergence is when the eyes uh, move inward together to see something at a very close distance. And that movement uh, of the eye muscles sends a signal to the brain and lets our brain know that that object is very close to us. And you can try the floating finger sausage here too, uh, which is another good way to see how binocular convergence works when our eyes are unfocused, when we're not converging, we have the floating finger sausage. When it is, conver when it is uh, converging together, then we can see the, just the two fingers. Uh, monocular cues are uh, what allows us to perceive depth at far distances. And monocular cues um, are done by each eye independently. There are six or seven different monocular cues, which we'll be uh, covering at a different point in class. Uh, motion perception uh, is the idea that uh, our brain basically works like a camera or our eyes work like a camera. What our brain does is it literally connects these images all in one, kind of the same way if you ever made a flip book, like when you were in elementary or middle school uh, out of like sticky notes. Uh, our brain does the same thing. While our eyes just take in individual images, our brain smooths them out in a process known as the fee phenomenon, um, which basically says that uh, if we um, make an image appear and then disappear enough uh, and have uh, uh, different images kind of going one after another after another, even though those images aren't moving, it will be perceived as movement to us. And if you want to take a look at an example of the fee phenomenon, uh, take a look at the other video that's going to be attached to the lecture. Finally, as we visually perceive, we also perceive uh, things in uh, subtle parts. Our eyes take in different characteristics, uh, but when they take in those characteristics, they're taking each one in separately. Our brain converges them and connects them all together, and this is known as parallel processing. And what we often see here uh, is form, depth, color, and motion are the four things that our eyes take in. Now, no matter what the sense, visual, hearing, smell, taste, touch, uh, we form a perceptual set. Our perceptual set is our overall perception of our environment in our current moment. Uh, but, and in many cases, our perceptual set ac accurately reflects uh, what it is we're experiencing. But our perceptual sets can be fooled. Uh, there are a number of different things, a couple different things that can affect our perceptual sets. One, our perceptual expectations. If you look at the images below and you see the Loch Ness Monster and space aliens, then you have this expectation that these things exist. And when you see these images, this confirms these ideas in your brain and which it makes it more likely for you to perceive a Loch Ness Monster or a space alien. And yet, if you don't believe that those exist, you'll probably just see a log and some clouds. Uh, and so your expectations can affect then how you perceive different things. Context can also affect our perceptions. If we take a look at the image above, um, especially the uh, figure in the center, if we're looking at 12 and 14 in context, we're more likely to see that one in the center as 13. But if we're looking at the A and the C, we're going to be more likely to see it as B. Uh, the player in yellow is six foot eight, even though he looks quite short because the player in blue is seven foot seven. So in context, we perceive him to be short. Uh, additionally, our emotional state uh, can affect how we perceive something. Uh, we can perceive something uh, to be exciting or we can perceive uh, things to be uh, sad based on our emotional state. Additionally, our motivational levels uh, can cause some, us to perceive things uh, in one way or another as well. Another example of our expectations, if we expect to see uh, a rabbit, like if I said Easter eggs, you'd probably see a bunny. If I said web feet and wings, you'd probably see a duck. So I'm adjusting your expectations. So the question here is, is the man inside or outside of the house? 
Now again, context and expectations play a big role. If you expect that 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 those that front corner is an indoor spot, if you believe that this image is a an open cross section of the house, uh, then and that's your expectation, uh, then you're going to see this in context as a guy sitting inside his house at his uh, out, out inside his house, and yet if you perceive that front corner and expect this to be somebody outside, then you're going to see him as outside the house. Gestalt psychology is a special subform of uh, perceptual psychology, which we look at uh, the perception of grouping and how we our brain naturally groups things together. One of the ways that it does this is by creating a figure ground relationship. Uh, now, this figure ground relationship is a form of grouping in which we perceive one thing to be kind of in front of us and everything else to be in the background. This can be uh, images, it can be people, it can be anything. If we take a look at the image on the right, do you perceive it to be a white vase on a black background or two black faces on a white background? Whichever way your brain perceives it, you're creating that figure ground relationship. Whichever one you see is the figure and then the background would be the ground. Uh, this can work with people too. If you see someone in a crowd that you really care about or uh, that you really notice, they become the figure and everybody else becomes the ground. Other ways that we group things in Gestalt psychology um, is through a variety of different means. Uh, one is proximity, which is when things are closer together, we're more likely to group them. When we look at that image in the top left, do we see six individual lines or three sets of two? If we see three sets of two, we're using proximity. Uh, with continuity, uh, we are connecting lines or making lines continuous even when sometimes they're not there. Uh, with similarity, we tend to group things together based on uh, their similar forms. Like, do you see nine shapes or do you see a set of three triangles, a third set of three circles, and a set of three triangles? Connectedness is when we uh, perceive a connections even when connections aren't there. Um, do you see two dots and a line or do you see two dots connected by a line? Again, we perceive it differently. And we could even have spaces between those lines and those dots and we'd still perceive them to be connected. And finally, closure uh, is when we're given things, seen an image like what's on the bottom here and where we uh, mentally connect and group uh, the areas that should feel closed to perceive uh, shapes or images that aren't there. And here are some examples of additional Gestalt psychology. This would be closure. This would be similarity. Connectedness. Proximity. Continuity. Finally, our brain has this ability to create what we call perceptual constancy, meaning that when we see an object at one angle and then another angle, our eyes are taking in a different image. We're seeing a different thing. And yet we know, our brain knows that it's the same object, that it's the same shape, that it's the same size. And so this is known as perceptual constancy, and this can work with shape, size, but also things like color and brightness. So like when you take a look at these two tables, these two tables have uh, size constancy uh, because uh, they are just obviously at different angles, but in fact, they are the same size. Which lends us to the question, what color is the dress? Well, ultimately, the dress is affected by brightness constancy. Because what we see here is that when there is more light on a certain color, we may perceive it as a different color. And yet our brain automatically knows that it's probably the same color. But it's just we're seeing it as different due to the effect of the brightness. Ultimately, the dress was blue and black. Uh, and you can see that in the darker version with a less brightness and less contrast. Uh, basically, what it comes down to is your expectations. Do you expect when you see something like this with this kind of lighting, is that dress in shadow? If you expect it's in shadow, you're going to perceive it as white and gold because of the effect that uh, lighting has uh, on the shadow. Yet, if you perceive it as just overly bright, 
uh, which it is, uh, then you're going to see uh, that the blue is being drowned out by the brightness um, and the black is reflecting the brightness of the light. And that is it.